Okay. We want to welcome everyone today to the Aspirational Healthcare Employers Group. And before I introduce Dr. Lisa Benke from ASSERT, I want to tell you just a little bit about the model and give you a chance to kind of see how it fits in this Aspirational Healthcare model. Awesome. So <clears throat> Aspirational Healthcare was pioneered by an amazing group of uh, Alaska Native people up in Anchorage, Alaska, which is basically, they had an opportunity to build healthcare from the ground up. And in doing so, they did something that no other healthcare system has ever done. They asked the customer what they wanted. Ama you know, imagine asking the customer what you want from healthcare. <laughs> and when they heard back from their 70,000 Alaska Native people what they wanted, what they said was, we want a healthcare system that is not just paternalistic and tells us what to do. It's like, that's not what we want. What we want is a healthcare system that journeys with us through life, helping us live life to its fullest. And they said, that's an amazing idea. Let's build a healthcare system around this concept of actually coming to the families and the communities, being a guest at their table and journeying through life with them, supporting them to reach their aspirations in life and weaving our healthcare knowledge and understanding to help them do that the very best. Well, now 20 years later, they have the best healthcare system in the world, countries from all over the world go to Alaska to figure out how do they get such an amazing healthcare system with 98% patient satisfaction, 93% employee satisfaction. They're the only healthcare system that's won the president's Malcolm Baldrige Award twice. And they've had superior health outcomes and they do it for half the price. And so when I learned about them, I'm like, okay, we need to shine a light on the best healthcare model in the country and help employers across the U.S. learn that there's a better way to do healthcare, much better at attracting and retaining talent, much better at creating relationships with the healthcare system, and much better at keeping healthy in the first place. So what we do is we help employers see that by applying three basic principles, that being... Um, alignment, choice, and relationship, any employer can build a plan even inside of the current fee-for-service broken healthcare system that we have that's far more aspirational to offer their employees. And, and first, I'll just mention as, uh, alignment means aligning the healthcare system to work for the employer to help the employer reach their business objectives. Employers seldom actually define why they buy healthcare. They seldom measure to see if they're getting it. And they certainly don't reward the system or even their own internal personnel in helping them reach those business objectives. So that's number one. The second thing is choice. You can't force anybody in anything new. If you do, they're just gonna think you're trying to get them into something that's just gonna cost money is bad for them. So what you do is you give people choice. And basically we suggest three separate buckets. Put your money into three separate buckets, not just buy a health plan, but put money into a catastrophic category. I'm going to come back to that because that's what we're going to talk a lot today about. But you also want to change the front door to healthcare. One of the biggest reasons healthcare is broken is because most of the primary care practices across the country are owned by the healthcare systems to be a funnel source up into the specialists and into the hospitals. So if employers want to change the system, they need to offer their employees money that the employee can use to buy what's called direct primary care or subscription-based primary care, which is an amazing way to take care of all your primary care needs on a subscription basis for, with a physician or a primary care provider who's not aligned with the broken system. Their whole incentive is to keep you healthy. They have a, a smaller number of patients and their whole goal is to keep you healthy. The second, the third bucket is cash. And we encourage employers to take advantage of the amazing accepted benefit HRA. We won't get into all the detail, but it, it's better than HSAs, it's better than HRAs, but it's a way to put money aside for your employees that can roll over, it can even stay open when they leave, they can use it to buy premiums, they can use it to just pay for qualified medical expenses. We won't go into all the detail today, but we encourage employers to put money in that bucket. And the fourth bucket is the foundation of what NUCA made so successful. The reason they became so successful is they put more effort in training their providers to be coaches, to literally walk on the path of life with their, their members 
helping them and supporting them to reach their aspirations. And so we encourage employers to put money aside for an incentive to really encourage employees and their families to engage with someone that's going to influence them, helping them live life to its fullest. Let's come, and then the third one is relationship. Relationship is key. You will hear that today as we talk about this, but have a relationship with primary care. Have a relationship with someone who's going to help you reach your life's aspirations. And then we're going to talk today about a relationship with someone who's going to help you navigate healthcare system. So coming back to category one under the option of choice. There's lots of ways to buy health care. There's lots of ways to buy a health plan for your employees to take care of catastrophic way, um, items. But we now live in a very different environment. The government has passed price transparency regulations that allow us to know what the cost of health care is. And what we're discovering regularly is that the very best price to buy health care is based on cash. So instead of buying the privilege of getting access to a network that's gone out and created discounts and discounted pricing at the hospitals, you're better off just sending your employees to buy health care on a cash pay basis with your money. And I'm not going to go into all of Dr. Benke's secrets and, and all of the stuff that she's ready to present, but that's what we're going to talk today about is really we live in an environment that I believe it won't be more than a few years before this will become the predominant way employers buy health care because for one, you eliminate almost half of all the cost of a hospital is into being able to bill insurance and revenue cycle management and third party reimbursement and being accredited in order to build the insurance companies. Like there is so much money in a hospital that goes towards just being able to get paid after the fact. They're better off getting paid up front. You're better off paying for it up front. So why not cut a tremendous amount of cost out of the healthcare system by just paying for healthcare on a cash pay basis up front. And with that introduction, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Lisa Benke, the chief medical officer and co-founder of Asserta Health, who is one of the few companies across the country that is actually administering a total cash-based health plan. Dr. Benke, you're welcome to say anything else you'd like to, if I've missed something that's important in the introduction, but take it away. I think that's a great introduction. Now, you'll find out quickly now that I'm the doctor in the group, not the technologist, so I hope I can share my screen correctly. <laughs> you should be able to. Okay. So I think if I do that, okay. I know how to do it in Teams, but Zoom is another story. <laughs> is it working? Can you see it? Not yet. You should be able to just click on that share screen at the bottom and then choose the monitor that you want to share and then just yeah, click on share. I thought I did that. Well, now I can't see anything except. Hmm. So Zoom is, they always want me to do a software update. Let's see. Oh, maybe this, maybe that. Sorry about this. You're just fine. I can save lives, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe that'll work. While we're waiting, hey, Daryl, one thing that, you know, talk about um, the tr price transparency stuff, the legislation out there is at a little bit of jeopardy right now, which could create some of our cat, some problems with cash pay. You know, I'm not glad you brought that up. It, it, Cynthia Fisher, who's the one that kind of spearheaded that, encouraged us a couple of weeks ago at a conference to write your congressman and let them know we do not want to see transparency, price transparency go, go away. So thanks so, for bringing that up. It now. <laughs> it can. Dr. Ben, okay, you're great. Working great. <laughs> okay. So I'm really excited to be able to share a sort of health with you today. I'm sorry that Corp couldn't be here with me. Um, he is off doing something really important. So we're glad that he's there. He's doing a finalist presentation today that's really important to us. Um, 
But Corbin and I founded a sort of health uh, based on the idea that cash is a better way to pay for healthcare. We met working at Ingenix, part of Optum and United Healthcare's um, family of companies. Um, and we both have decades of experience and a really uncommon 360 degree perspective on what's wrong with healthcare payment. Um, Corb managed both revenue cycle management and payment integrity businesses. And I'm a nurse and a medical doctor with uh, deep experience in both physician and hospital billing, as well as health plan payment administration and clinical program management. Um, we are absolutely convinced that healthcare is never going to be more affordable unless we fundamentally change the way we pay for it. You may have heard of the Iron Triangle of healthcare, and it's the you know the it's a healthcare policy construct that refers to the perspective that healthcare is a rigid zero sum game, that it's virtually impossible to improve cost, quality, and access all at the same time. If you improve one, you're going to negatively impact at least one of the other two. And so far it's basically been true. Uh, PPO plans prioritize access, but lead to unsustainable cost. RBP plans lower cost at the expense of access and centers of excellence offer great quality and cost, but they offer a limited scope of services and limited access. We believe that cash actually breaks the iron triangle. Uh, it, and we created a sort of help to make cash payment available to self-funded employers. Um, we give consumers the tools to use cash to, to, use, to pay cash with their employer's money so they don't have to pay out of pocket and then wait to be reimbursed. We give them personal support and you know high levels of member engagement to really help them with their decision making and help them kind of step by step through the whole process. And of course, we found that providers love getting paid this way because they get immediate cash in their bank account without the hassle of claims and billing and collections. And um, it's interesting after we work with hospitals for a while, they start calling us and saying, isn't this your patient? Even when they have an emergency admission we didn't know anything about, you know, they'll call and say, can you pay us? So it, it really is, um, you know, something that we've enjoyed watching. <laughs> Um, and these are, you know, this is a, a sample of results. Um, we averaged less than 140% of Medicare across all, you know, thousands of cash pay cases. And we found that it doesn't work just for big things. It works for the small things too. Um, you know, we've, we've done simple x-rays and office visits and we've over time developed different tools to handle different types of payments. Um, you know, with with concierge support, we consistently achieve a great patient experience and reference-based pricing like economics with a lot less friction with the provider community, much less uh, issue with access um, because the provider has agreed to be paid upfront and doesn't have to worry about whether they'll be, you know, whether or what they'll be paid later. Uh, what makes this possible is our technology platform, and it's called MediCash. Um, it's a proprietary platform that we've built from scratch with all the knowledge that we have about the healthcare payment. Uh, we manage all the processes and details required to efficiently operate a cash payment program and price uh, claims based on Medicare derivatives uh, using the same rigor you would use to process claims. So we're applying all the same rules uh, to you know how we measure and how we how we measure a cash price against uh, a claims price, we can now issue debit cards uh, to adult plan members and preload them with funds that they can use to pay for low cost services like simple X rays or office visits, um, and we capture all of the essential data in the MediCash platform and submit paid claims to the, the plan administrator. So no data is lost um, you know, for reporting and stop loss purposes. We uh, also use essentially electronic super bills to administer direct contracts where a physician or 
uh, other type of provider has agreed to cash payment up front. And we set up a super bill where they basically go in, you know, identify the patient they've seen from a roster, enter a date of service and an ICD-10 code, and then pick the services from a super bill that also prevents them from billing for two things that can't be billed for together or a service that's included in another service, you know, at the same time. Uh, but they're, when they do that, they're paid immediately. And we generate, you know, we still capture all of the information for the plan. There. So our service model is really built on a concierge team to help the patient, you know, help people navigate the healthcare system because it's not easy to be a cash patient. You know, some people are very bold and they don't mind going in and saying, what's the cash price? And that sounds too high and arguing. Other people are terrified to do that. So we give them, you know, hand holding and step by step support to help them understand what's going on. As you might imagine, too, you know, not everybody who works in a hospital understands cash payment. And sometimes we have to navigate to the right people who can understand what we're talking about and how we want to pay them. Um, so we have a negotiation team that works with providers to ensure that the prices we're paying are appropriate and to make sure that we're reaching the right people in a facility or in a provider organization to uh, understand what their cash prices are. And then, you know, we also have the payment expertise to leverage all those federal rules and, and laws that uh, Daryl was referring to. With all of that, we're able to give people a world-class experience uh, at dramatically improved savings. Um, and this is just an example of the law. I mean, certainly the Consolidated Appropriation Act uh, has, and you know, all of the requirements that have been published with it have really made cash more interesting. And there's actually, you know, there are hip, there's HIPAA legislation that basically says if you say you want to be a cash patient, the facility or provider cannot tell you, no, you have insurance that's illegal. It's actually illegal for them not to make you a cash patient when you want to be. Uh, and CMS has issued regulation that makes it very clear that somebody who decides not to use their insurance and pay cash up front is a self-pay patient and needs to be treated as a self-pay patient. Can, so, I, can I just jump in here and just yes. put an exclamation point on that? I yes. really want to highlight that. That is such a critical part of this transformation, moving to cash pay, is that it's different. People are used to just pulling out their insurance card and giving it to the hospital, and the hospital is certainly used to asking for the insurance card. But the government has now allowed and made it very clear that anyone in this country has a citizen right to not tell their health care provider that they have insurance. And so if the employer chooses to buy health care for their employees on the employer's money, giving their employees a debit card and saying, we're going to put the money on the card, pay for it as cash. That's what creates this whole thing. And for those that want to argue and say, oh, no, we don't know how to do that. Or no, we don't. Oh, oh we still need your insurance card. It's like, no, we need to push back and say, I'm sorry, I have the right, if I'm willing to pay cash up front, which this facilitates, to not tell you that I have insurance. I just I just want to accentuate that. That is such a critical part. It is. Thank you. There. So, you know, we started out uh, in the beginning just paying for high cost services, and we've now built a full service cash centric health plan where cash is the primary benefit tier. But we offer cash payment capabilities in a lot of different ways, and we often start out as a bolt on attached to an existing self funded plan or a PPO plan, you know, either a, an RBP plan or a PPO plan. We can integrate with any any TPA that's willing to work with us, or we can operate completely outside the plan and send our receipts directly to the stop loss carrier and, and the employer. Um, when we operate on the bolt on, there's really no risk to the employer because we charge just flat case fees that are paid only when we're successful. 
So there's really no, um, you know, there's no upfront cost to working with us there. But of course, with the bolt-on, we only you know, we're not aware of as many cases before they before they're scheduled, and the the members have to remember to call us. We have a number of um, employers that are very active in making sure their members know um, that they need to call us, and that as soon as they hear that you know something's happening, they remind them to call us but we capture about 25% of the services that would otherwise be eligible. So the savings you know, are not as dramatic as they are uh, with a cash-centric health plan where we do charge a PEPM for that service because we basically take over all customer service and medical management. So we take all of the member calls, all of the provider calls, all the pre-certification goes through us and we use every phone call as an opportunity to identify an opportunity for cash, you know, an opportunity to pay cash. And cash is really the primary benefit here. Members have no out-of-pocket cost whenever we pay cash for something. And they can choose, you know, for each service, whether they want to use cash or have the provider submit a claim. The choice is always there. So it's not forced on them. But if they work with us and we pay cash, they have no out-of-pocket. If they don't, uh, they submit a claim, they'll have standard out-of-pocket responsibility that applies. Can I jump in again? Yes, you can. Just another point that I think is so important. Imagine an employer offering a health plan to their employees that says, you won't have to pay any co-pays. You won't have to pay any deductibles. Healthcare is going to be entirely paid by me. That is such an amazing recruitment strategy. And to the employee, it's like, serious? I mean, like, I can't even imagine that. So I just want to accentuate that. that if they'll go through the cash strategy, most employers set it up to where there's no cost to the employee. And what a benefit and what an incentive to encourage people to use the cash bank. It really Sorry, does. Interrupting, but that was such an important point. I just want to emphasize. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, the other thing that we're, you know, that we're doing uh, with this cash centric plan is we're learning that it's a really powerful strategy with direct primary care. So, you know, direct primary care really uh, works to control utilization. So, you know, if a, a really good direct primary care implementation reduces the number of specialist visits, reduces the number of um, unnecessary tests and other things, you know, that would otherwise happen if someone's trying to navigate on their own. But once they have to refer out of their four walls, then they really lose control of cost. They can refer to people that, you know, they think are offering affordable prices, but they really don't know. And so in those cases where we have established a relationship and we're in a plan together where there's a direct primary care component and then we take all of the referrals that come out of direct primary care and we manage cash you know, payment for all of the services someone needs that are not in the walls of primary care. So it's a really powerful strategy to put both of those together. Um, and especially when we add the debit cards with that, because then even all of the specialist visits, just routine specialist visits or, you know, diagnostic tests that need to be done outside of the DPC's office uh, can be managed with cash very easily, even when they're lower cost services. In the cash centric health plan, we really behave as the hub of the health plan. So there are several components here. I mean, we have a, you know, a benefit plan that prioritizes cash and makes cash the primary strategy. We have a service model that really makes it very likely that we're going to find out about all services that are all elective services that are needed ahead of time. And then a variety of different payment tools, whether it's our concierge managed cases where we're making the payments the debit cards where we're loading them and the members making the payment or the electronic super bills where a partner is using a super bill to pay themselves basically. Um, but we're kind of at the center of the health plan and managing all of those, those aspects. Let's see there. 
This is just an example of our pricing. We do charge per case fees for the concierge fees, uh, for the concierge cases. These are flat fees. We never charge a percent of savings. Um, when someone is using a super bill, we charge 5% of the transaction, but it's capped at $150. And for our full service model, we have a PPM that varies from 18 to $23, depending on the scope of services. Um, we can also do just you know, a bolt-on model with just the case fees and debit cards um, at a lower PPM when we're not taking all of the, uh, you know, all of the customer service calls. And that's really it. <laughs> We really believe that the only way to make healthcare more affordable is to pay for it the same way we pay for everything else, direct, transparent, and immediate. And we are uh, well on our, well, I think we've pretty much figured out how to do that for just about any healthcare service at this point. <laughs> so Dr. Benke, let, let me ask you to describe, because there might be some people on the call that don't understand what is self-funding versus insurance. You know, most companies think, well, we're just going to buy an insurance plan. Um, mm -hmm. But over 100 employees, many times you're much better off being self-funded. But explain what that means, because you're not truly taking full risk for everything that hits $10 million or stop less in there. So kind of just give the basics of what it means to build a self-funded plan and then how you just fit right into that. Yes. And, you know, there's no reason really why we can't work with a fully insured plan. It's just that the payer, the, the fully insured plan would be need to be the one to pay us because <laughs> they're the ones who would benefit. <laughs> right. um, and, you know, we, we built this for self-funded employers who really want to, um, really want to do something that helps their employees as, you know, as the program you've described so often um, that, you know, they don't want to just, buy an off the shelf product and, and have the same thing they would have if they were fully insured, just paying their own claims. When you're self-funded, you do pay your own claims, but you do have protection through stop loss so that if you have a bad year or a catastrophic case, um, you know, you're know you not on the hook for all of that, but you do get to keep the savings. So uh, if you buy a fully insured plan, maybe your rate won't go up as much the next year but that's not really based just on your own experience and what you've done as an employer. It's based on the whole pool of who's in that self-funded plan. So you may have a great year. You may do a great job of you know, helping your employees be healthier and helping them make good choices and choosing you know, cost-effective care and reducing utilization, but that doesn't necessarily translate into better experience for you if you're in a fully insured plan. Can you, can you, or, or I'll just kind of put it out there and you can kind of give the details, but I love your idea of saying to employer, okay, build a self-funded plan, mm -hmm. you know, where it's got deductibles and co-pays and give everybody an insurance card so they can feel like, oh, I've got an insurance card. I can walk home and say, look, honey, I've got an insurance card. <laughs> but then put it in I your like dresser. Logos. <laughs> and it has the logos of all the, you know, but but put that in your dresser drawer. Don't take it out because I'm also going to hand you a debit card. And this is this is where you get to draw money out of the company bank account and literally load that money with a you know a few hundred dollars to say, look, use this for specialty visits. If you need anything that's big, just call the concierge. But satisfy their need to have an insurance card, but give them this huge incentive to just use the company credit card or debit card. And literally by using that, they're not paying anything. They're not paying any co-pays, deductibles. They're literally, the employer is buying healthcare directly from the provider without all the middlemen. Oh. Have I explained that well, or what, what have I missed? No, you explained it perfectly. You know, Use a use a regular health plan card with a logo on it, and just tell people not to use it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and because you're self funded, the fact mm -hmm. that nobody uses it, there's no cost. It's like there might be some a little bit of administrative cost, but but because the claims aren't flowing through that plan, they're fo fo they're flowing through your plan that's paying for cash. You're getting the best deal. 
I, I also want to share for those that may not know how drastically the difference can be between an insurance cost and a cash pay price. I want to give an example of a large, large hospital here in Utah. If you go to their publicly available now fee schedule and you download it, um, you'll find this across the board. But I'll give you an example of their largest procedure, which is a living lung transplant. <laughs> Well, if, if you look at their gross charges for that living lung transplant, it's 320 something thousand dollars. But if you're lucky enough to buy a network contract, so you can say, I've got insurance, I'm going to pay a discounted rate. The average is 220,000. So you're going to get a hundred thousand dollar savings by the fact that you're using insurance. But if you walk in and say, I'm paying cash, it's $80,000. So there's no comparison between what you buy insurance to pay health care for versus what you're paying if you just buy cash. That's that's more than a 50 percent reduction in the cost of that living li that living liver transplant because you simply gave them cash. It, it's enormous. In other words, this is not a small reduction. This is enormous. So I've asked a lot of questions. Let me open it up to the group. Um, I'm going to go ahead and. Why don't you stop sharing on your screen and stop I'll share. Okay. Let me figure out how to do that. Um, I have a question. So how do you get the how do you get to the quality side of things? I mean, I and I you know that can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So how do you get to the quality side of things? In other words, you can get it cheap, but is it always quality? And I, I do know part of the answer to that is generally the 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 uh there's an inverse relationship between quality and cost. I know that's in, you know, kind of a, a unknown right. in a lot of respects, but is there any kind of thing that's involved in your platform or your project or your process that would get to quality? That's a great question. And, you know, we do use available quality data. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of quality data available uh, for many procedures, but where it is available, we use it. Um, we're always looking at value in terms of, I mean, you obviously don't get much value if you pay a low price for poor quality. Um, so we're really looking at a high, we're looking for high quality at a reasonable cost. And so is that like Quantros data or what, what are you looking at? Well, we have used Quantros data. Um, I right now we're using Perception Health, which has better data for some things, not as good for other things. Um, I think there are, you know, that there are a lot of different tools out there. None of them are perfect. <laughs> well, but I think I think the point is really important, and let's kind of focus on that just for a second. A lot of people think that if you pay more in healthcare, you're getting better quality care. And that's just not true. A lot of times, the reason healthcare is less expensive at one provider is because they do a lot of those procedures and they become very effective and efficient and have high levels of quality. So the ones that charge more is because they don't do them as often and they have a lot more complications and they have to charge more. So I think that's a very good point that you're not offering your employees just a discounted health insurance by paying cash. You're actually guiding them to the best providers with the best outcomes and the best price. And you're letting a person do that for you. You're not asking your employee to be the navigator. Dr. Um, Benke's organization serves up that concierge navigator so that it's easy for your employees. You just simply call the navigator and say, where should I go? So I've got a question. This is Mark Holland. How would you handle um, a situation where, like in, in a situation with an orthopedic doctor, let's just say you go into an urgent care with a broken leg. Mm -hmm. um, so at, at the checkout, if you walk in and ask to pay cash, typically they're going to charge you, they don't know what the bill's going to be. So they're going to charge you some lump sum, like an estimate of X hundreds of dollars um, before they have uh, found all of the um, figured out what the charges are going to be. 
And the other part of that would be balanced billing as there may be some trickle charges that come in because the doctor's offices don't have their systems uh, in a way that <laughs> should be efficient and be able to uh, give you what all the charges are when you walk out the door. So most urgent cares do have cash prices. Um, and we, you know, that's one of the things we manage with the debit cards. Um, if we can't get all of the charges right then, we would call them and and find out when they'll be available and work with, tell them we wanna pay cash as soon as they can tell us what all the charges are and we'd work with them on that. And, and Mark's example was specifically like a surgeon, like an orthopedic surgeon. And Mark, I had that experience a year ago. I broke <laughs> my ankle. My direct primary care provider said, yep, the x-ray says you have a broken ankle. I took the x-rays to a specialist and I walked in and said, I'm cash pay. And in that case, they knew exactly what to do. In fact, they said, oh, that's great. We roll out the red carpet for you. <laughs> so yeah, that's not everybody's case. But if you just walk in and say, I'm a self-pay cash upfront patient, and here's my debit card that's from my company. I mean, it's like, I'm going to pay you. And so then they'll figure out what do, what do they need, and they'll just put it on that card. And what one one additional question um, earlier in the presentation you mentioned a super bill. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with what a super bill is. Yes, yeah, so I'm dating myself, I guess. Before electronic medical records, <laughs> that is how us physicians charge for things. We had a, a piece of paper that listed all the CPT codes, and at the end of a visit, we would mark, you know, what did we do during that visit. So we basically taken that concept and turned it into an electronic tool. So um, if you're a primary care physician and you saw a patient in the office and it was a follow-up visit and you're charging um, for a, a follow-up visit and you did a, uh, an EKG and um, you gave a flu shot, um, all those things would be listed on your super bill and you would go into the uh, log into our system. It takes about five minutes to do this, log into the system, pick the patient from a roster, pick the, uh, enter an ICD-10 code that says why the patient was there in your office and then pick the code that you, for the office visit, the code for the flu shot and the code for the EKG and hit submit and you're paid immediately. So it's a way to administer direct contracts. You know, there are a lot of employers who have taken the time to work with local employer or local providers and develop direct contracts that say, you know, I'm gonna pay you 120% of Medicare or 150% of Medicare, but then you have to count on your TPA to be able to pay those claims correctly when they come in. And then sometimes they don't get paid correctly. And then the provider is not very happy because they've got this special deal with you, but they have to spend a lot of time getting those claims paid correctly. Um, with our system, that direct contract is automated. They, you know, we've already got all the prices in the system. They just click what they did and they're paid immediately. I have Does that two. answer your question? <laughs> yep, thank you. Okay. I mean, today in, with electronic medical records, I think there are still some where people check things off, but a lot of that is determined by the medical record, um, what was actually done and, and the bill is generated from that. Nelson, did you have a question? I will unmute myself. I, 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 I do have a question. Uh, and and actually, Lisa. Hi, hi, Lisa. Great to see you. I know. Uh, I, I you too. think I think I've actually asked this question of you, but I was going through my notes yesterday uh, mm -hmm. about Asserta, and I didn't have an answer to this. Uh, how are drugs handled so with, with with the Asserta plan? It that's something that we do sort of on a case by case basis. It depends on what. You know, if it's something that's being paid through the medical benefit, then we do that with cash just like everything else. So like in infusions and things like that, we do with cash, chemotherapy, um, that sort of thing. If it's through the pharmacy benefit, then there's usually a PBM involved. 
Um, we do have some people that are importing drugs or we have one client that we use debit cards for because they're near the Texas-Mexico border and they go across the border to Mexico to buy drugs <laughs> and they use debit cards to pay for it. So we can, you know, there are a lot of different ways we can deal with pharmacy. Okay, thank you. Going back to the prior question about um, just paying for cash and getting the discount, I wanted to share an example. Some hospitals, if you go to their online fee schedule, will show that their cash price is the same as their gross charges. Hence, there's no discount. Yeah. And you might think, well, then stay away from those places because by paying cash, you're not going to get any discount. You're better off using your insurance card. Well, the truth is, and this is why there's a concierge navigator that's helping you do this. Because a year ago, I went to a hospital owned by the company I used to run hospitals for. <laughs> and I said, I'm paying cash. And they said, oh, well, we happen to give people who pay cash a 75% discount down to Medicare. Now, that's not what their fee schedule said. Their fee schedule said there was no discount. But because I was willing to walk in and pay cash up front, they gave me a 75% discount down to their Medicare rate. So, and that's why the navigator, the concierge navigator is such a key role to not just be available with that, but to have a relationship with so that the members like, I got the best health plan in the world. I don't have to do anything. I just simply walk in, say I'm self-pay. I just give them my card. I give them the phone number of my concierge. They work it all out. I walk out, I get great health care, and I don't pay anything for it. So cash pay isn't just about getting a better discount because their fee schedule says you get it, but it's that negotiation up front. Yes. And it's very, I mean, as you might imagine, hospitals um, have varying degrees of interest in, in promoting their cash payments or their cash prices. And what they don't want to do is say, this is my self-pay price, and then have somebody come in and say, well, I want to do a payment plan. And then after they've made three or four payments, we have to chase them to get the rest. Right. So it very often, we will get a very different answer when we call and ask for a cash price that we want to pay up front. And, you know, it should be easier than it is, but it isn't. And that's why we, you know, you have to really understand who you're talking to and whether that person has a clue what you're asking. If you call a physician's office and ask for a cash price, they will almost always give you their bill charge because they don't do the, they don't, do payment re reconciliation at the front desk and they don't really know how that works. So they'll tell you, you know, what their bill charges. And then you say, well, is that what you get paid? And they have no idea. So you really have to assess the knowledge of the person um, that you're talking to and understand how this hospital deals with cash patients, because some, you know, will send you to a financial counselor and they'll do use the same person for cash and for, um, self-pay patients who want to do a payment plan, but they will often very clearly tell you, oh, well, if you're going to pay the whole thing up front, it's this price. Yeah. Otherwise, it's this price because you're not going to pay it all at once. Or they'll say, you know, some hospitals will say, well, we give a 43% discount for self-pay, but if you pay the whole thing with it up front, it's another 10%. Or if you pay within 30 days, it's another 30%. So, you know, and, and then there's individual negotiations where we say, well, this price is, is too high because these are two, you're pricing two CPT codes and you're adding them together, but actually that's not how it would work if you were um, generating a bill. So, you know, can we, let me show you how that would be different. And sometimes, you know, we'll end up with a, a very different price in negotiations. <laughs> So this is Mark Holland. Again, I thought I would add something just from, I was on a webinar yesterday and they actually had a hospital provider on and mm -hmm. was talking, addressing direct contracts. And there was a couple of numbers that uh, I think are, are worth sharing with the group. She said that whenever at, at their, ho or their hospital, whenever uh, it's a $500 balance, that 68% of the time they don't collect it as in it does they, and so they're already writing off that other piece so that's in in the prices when you see the charge master and then the other one was on a five thousand dollar balance their expected collect rate is 25 percent 
Mm -hmm. Excellent points, Mark. I'm glad you brought that up. It, it really is in the provider's best interest to collect cash up front. Well, because, because what ends up happening in that case is you have an employee that ends up with an endless debt, um, mm -hmm. you know, essentially medical debt, which we know is running rampant, and the hospital doesn't get the money anyway. Yeah. Um, Lisa, this is Kim Lynch, and I'm I'm so excited to be here. Uh, Daryl, I am just delighted to have been invited to this group by you because every time it makes me smile. So I'm under the weather today, which is why I'm off the camera. But I'm CEO of Metis Health, um, and I've worked in value based and all sorts of different things. So I love what you are doing because I just see it as increasing optionality, right? Optionality and access. Um, so my two questions are, one, similar to the PBM interface, do you have to, and how do you interface with clearing houses? And two, what are some of the common objections you hear from providers? Because I think they should be saying yes to this all over the place. Um, yes, I mean, most of the time we don't, well, clearing houses, we do, I mean, we have a payer ID and sometimes if somebody if they want to pay want to be paid afterwards and we do have some there okay. is a, um there's one provider in particular in texas that i spent probably three days trying to figure out how to pay them up front and they just couldn't handle it like they couldn't <laughs> getting paid up front so i finally just said send a claim here and then i'll pay you <laughs> and they did it so and then they could do it okay yes <laughs> <laughs> yes. And and we actually are doing um, we're starting to to do a lot of reference based pricing, pricing even for claims. So all the claims come to us and then um, okay. you know, those we can just settle with cash uh, will do. So we do interface that way. But I don't know if that's what you're really asking me about clearing. Yes. Yeah, no, it is. It is. Do so you okay. basically take the place of that motion for them? And the answer is yes. Yes. Um, and. The, the, the objections mostly that we hear from providers is that it's illegal to pay cash. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I hear that too from my customers yes. and I'm like, I assure you it's not. And it's in fact, illegal. your your patients are going to love it and they do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we actually arm our, we arm the members with the law so that they can say, no, look, mm -hmm. the law says, <laughs> you know, here's where it says that. You're it's on the bond side of the law. <laughs> it's actually illegal to refuse to let me pay cash. That's right. right. Um, and the other objection we hear is that we have no idea, you know, how much it would cost because until we till we do a bill. Hmm. And you know, in that case, they, there's no way they could predict what the cost is up front. Well, and it, is the new transparency law is helping with that because you know yes. the fact that they have to create estimates. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's so common. I've dealt with that personally. It's just ridiculous. They can't even give you, they can't give you an estimate even. I have no idea. Kind of like, it's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, it is kind of ridiculous. And, you know, I think it's also, and that's where our concierge team really comes in because it's just sometimes you're talking to someone who has no idea and they're not the right person to talk to and they'll give you some answer that makes no sense. But if you're the patient, it's hard to argue with them. So, you know, we, we've we gotten very good at navigating our way around, a, you know, a healthcare organization and understanding who we need to get to um, in order to find someone, you know, who will, I mean, I've called up I called the CEO of the hospital one time and said, you know what, I've been trying, this person is having a big expensive procedure at your facility and I want to pay you and no one in your organization can figure <laughs> out how to take my money. <laughs> I will say that about a year ago, Modern Healthcare, which is kind of the premier magazine for healthcare and hospitals, put a whole front cover article on hospitals need to prepare to take cash. Mm -hmm. And isn't it true, Lisa, that a lot of the sharing programs that are running around for 40 years who have been encouraging their members to use this cash pay have actually pioneered and kind of paved the way a little bit for this cash pay where more and more providers are hearing people come in on a sharing program and say, well, I'm paying cash. And so they're kind of getting used to that. Now, often those sharing programs are paying after the fact 
even though it's cash, it's after the fact. You're walking in and saying, no, I want to pay you before the procedure, which is even better for the hospital and the provider. Lisa, can you speak to um, how the um, financial relationship works with the employer as far as do you guys draft an account from them whenever they pay or do they have to put money in up front? So that goes through our payment platform. They have to set up an account, which takes um, as it takes about 15 minutes total to set up an account. You, They can use the same bank account they use to fund claims through their TPA. Uh, it doesn't have to be a special bank account, but they do need to connect it to our payment platform. For big procedures, when we're doing, you know, the like the case, like a knee replacement or a, you know, a, a, a surgery, something like that, where it's a, a larger amount, we prepare a calculation where we show them compared to the reference price they've asked us to use. Um, we we calculate what you know if the if the reference price is 150 percent of Medicare, we calculate 150 percent of Medicare, and we show them what the cost of this procedure is compared to that reference price with our case fee included. And we send that to them and to show them what they would have paid without us and what they would pay if they approve this procedure. Uh, there's a two-step process. It can be done by the same person, but some employers like to have it separated. There's an approval process where the person looks at this calculation and says, yes, I agree. This is a good deal for me. I want this. And they say yes. And then there's a funding part. And again, that can be done by the same person, but some employers want someone else to do the funding. Uh, once we get the approval to move forward with the case, another message goes out asking for the funds. And they just click on a link, enter a, um, enter a PIN, and the funds flow to, into our account in Medicash. So then we have the funds there. That's a very important point because we do need to have the funds up front. I mean, obviously, if we're paying cash, we have to pay in advance um, to get the best price. And so we do need, if, if there is employee responsibility and some of our clients don't want to make it completely free, they still want the, the member to pay something, um, the member would have to pay that amount to us up front as well so that we can pay the full cash price. But that's, that's um, not but that's how that funding right? works. If we're using debit cards, there does have to be an escrow balance to handle those, and it just gets topped up as the balance comes down. Can, can I ask a, a quick question? Sorry, I couldn't raise my hand because uh, sure. I'm in a car. Go ahead, man. Um, so the... Is the issue really related to a fundamental flaw in our billing and coding? It's all CPT codes. So facilities are used to billing codes and they don't know the codes are necessarily going to bill on visits until after the fact. So how do you, how do you navigate that with cash up front? Um, you know, with health systems that don't even have bundles in place for surgical procedures. Um, even you know a physician visit, they don't know what level the visit's going to be. So I, I think that we're, we're dealing with a fundamental flaw in our billing methodology that I think is causing some of your issues. So so I wonder how the payment up front works when the provider community is so confused about billing in a different way. And can I just can I just add to Matt's question, Dr. Benke? Because you and I've talked about this before. There's a difference between a CPT code or bundle. Mm -hmm or a diagnosis code or, or a DRG, and then a HICSPIX or a CPT2 code. Because the detailed bills generally after the math come out on CPT code, two codes, but estimates and upfront bundles are generally based on CPT versus CPT2. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of expertise with CPT coding because I actually represented the field of gastroenterology on the committee that makes them. and. Mm -hmm. You know, the AMA CPT code committee works a lot like Congress. Like you, if you're the GI representative and you want a new code, you got to get somebody else to support your code. So you got to go over to the urologist and say, hey, I got a new code. What do you have? You know, if I support <laughs> yours, you support mine. So you see that some CPT sets are very detailed and any little permutation on the procedure, they've got another code. Others, you know, you struggle to find the right code. Um, so 
that is a, an important point that I didn't mention. Um, every the, for big surgery cases, for all the you know more complex cases, we do a, a clinical review when the case comes into us when we first find out about it, and we a lot of times I can determine just by reading the notes what the CPT code would be or what CPT code we need to use to price. Um, other times we need to get information from more information from the physician before we can do that. But so yes, we do sometimes to have to have a conversation where we say, okay, let's, we're going to assume that this is a colonoscopy, for example, um, we're going to assume it's just a screening colonoscopy and nothing's going to be found. But if you find something and there is an additional cost, um, an additional charge, then we'll settle that afterwards. And if people are concerned about that, that will usually take care of the problem. And we do that, you know, if, if uh, you know, something unexpected happens during the procedure, we don't expect people to take risk yeah. um, for things that they can't predict. So if something happens and, you know, the, it, be, it becomes a different procedure or we're paying based on a DRG and the person has problems during that hospitalization, and a different DRG becomes appropriate, then we will make an incremental payment. Nice. Dr. Benke, thank you so much. We're out of time. So we're gonna go ahead and close this down. Bye. But I just I just wanna tell everyone, thank you for being on today. Thank you for your amazing questions. And um, Everybody. keep in mind, we're gonna be doing another one October 6th. So our next Aspirational Healthcare Employers Group will be October 6th. We invite you to participate then. And again, uh, this has just been amazing. I appreciate it, Dr. Benke. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate everybody and what wonderful questions. And I hope everybody has a great holiday weekend. You too. Thank you. Take care. Bye now.